we are about to start our next session good afternoon our next session is isc as a global institute reaching the top which will be chaired by our former director professor p balram professor bal absolutely don't need any so professor balram absolutely don't need any introduction so skipping these formalities i'll try uh, i'll request may I request professor balram to chair the session good afternoon i must thank the organizers for inviting me to chair a session at this global conference which is uh, titled as iisc as a global institution uh, reaching the top i guess the organizers figured that after nearly a decade at the helm iisc has not reached the top so i should now chair a session on how we actually get there and the way we're going to do this is we have uh, two speakers uh, professor sunil kumar and professor usha vijay raghavan both of whom will address this subject uh, professor anurag kumar is also listed on the program as one of the speakers unfortunately he's not well and can't be here today but he has already presented some of the material that he would have presented in this session on the first day so i guess without uh, spending too much time i will introduce our first speaker very very briefly one of our most distinguished alumni a uh, professor sunil kumar he is the dean at the booth school of business at the university of chicago he was here in the computer science department many years ago as a master student and afterwards moved away to do his phd at the university of urbana and uh, illinois at urbana champaign and later on had a very distinguished career as a faculty member at stanford before moving to chicago as the dean professor sunil kumar this will get done i i apologize i don't have a powerpoint presentation and i chose not to it's not that i didn't prepare for the talk i have several pages of notes it's just that uh, the only picture i wanted to draw i didn't know how to label the axis and uh, it's bad manners to come up with conceptual pictures and so i decided uh, i would try to get you to imagine the picture any which way it occurred in your head Uh, rather than try and be normative about what the picture should look like. So, with that, uh, I'd like to begin by saying uh, I'm honored and humbled to be here among such a distinguished crowd, um, and uh, I'm also very grateful to the Alumni Association of North America because part of my role today is to be scribe for the conference that was held two years ago at Chicago. So, I'm uh, merely reporting. And as the joke goes, uh, this is towards the end of the conference. It's the home stretch. Uh, everything has been said, but not by everyone. And so most of what I'll do, you'd have heard before. Uh, I'm just trying to put it in a context and perhaps provide a summary for the conference. And again, if at any time I come across as being even slightly critical, uh, just think of me as an insolent child. Uh, I'm somewhat naive about the institute, and so for the most part, I will talk about my own, the two institutions that Professor Balram alluded to, and uh, so the two institutions uh, were Stanford and Chicago, and I thought maybe I'll tell you a little bit about Chicago Booth as well. So Chicago Booth is a business school which is part of the University of Chicago. Uh, we are a, as you know, University of Chicago is a relatively young university. It's probably the youngest of the top ten schools. 
Uh, it was started in 1892, and uh, the business school was started in 1898. Um, and uh, one way Chicago is known in India is, of course, through S. Chandrasekhar, who was on our physics faculty for a long time, thanks to Mr. Eddington. And, uh, and uh, um, we are known in two disciplines primarily, physical sciences, and the social sciences, which the intersection with IAC is somewhat small. And unfortunately, I belong to the social science end of the spectrum. Uh, I'm an operations research guy who drifted further and further into social sciences. And um, so uh, we have, among our faculty and our alumni, uh, 90 Nobel Prize winners. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> I I, I take no credit for it. <laughs> um, we have uh, the business school is a very different business school. We have seven on our faculty, uh, uh, including t we won the 2013 uh, Nobel and the Clark. The business school did, and uh, and so one of the reasons I'm dropping all these stats and attempting to make you know shine in reflected glory. By the way, the guy who won in 2013 wrote his paper a year before I was born, and therefore I'm taking full credit. <laughs> uh, so um, uh, the reason is we are a very different business school. The average business school doesn't count progress in Nobel Prizes. And uh, so why did we end up this way? And and I'm not implying that there is a top that we have reached or IASC has reached, uh, but rather that this is a climb. We're all climbing. We are climbing different hills. So before I get there, I want to say one other thing, which is uh, this is a science institution, and we should attempt to be precise, even in general talks like this. And so I'd like to define top uh, for purposes, or at least what height means. Uh, and for me, it's about, I have two hypotheses about that, one of which I believe is not controversial, and the other which might be. So the non-controversial hypothesis is top is defined by people. Not by buildings, not by labs, not by centers, not by acreage, not by grants given by government, not by inputs, but by outputs. So it is measured, top is measured by people and their achievements. So that's my first hypothesis, which I think is non-controversial. The second one is somewhat more controversial. The second hypothesis is that eminence of an institution, an eminence, as one judge famously said in a somewhat less pleasant context, you know it when you see it. Uh, so eminence is defined by the right tail of the people. So the average matters in as much as it drives the right tape. This is a controversial hypothesis, but it helps my metaphor move along. So indulge me for now. And uh, if at the end of this talk you find that this hypothesis is too much to swallow, well, I, I managed to keep you for half an hour in a pleasant air-conditioned room. So, so what is the metaphor? So here's the exercise that I'm going to try. I'm from the social sciences, so we're not afraid of getting people to do stuff, or at least attempting to. You don't need to close your eyes, but imagine the following. It's near dusk. You're in a hilly landscape. There are, there are hills, some steep and high, some just gentle rolling hills. And there are valleys, and there are chasms. So that's the landscape. And it's near dusk, and then you notice the landscape is not empty. But there are little, what look like little white caterpillars, little white tents moving around. In fact, you're not even sure they're moving. They appear mostly stationary. Everybody still with me on the metaphor? OK, well, I'm, I'm, I'm making progress. And then you decide to take a closer look at one of these little caterpillars from far away. And it's actually a tent. It's a tent with poles of unequal height. And the poles are spread around, and there's some canvas over it. And, uh, and so you can, you can imagine a kind of asymmetric circus tent. So that's what each of these is. And then you watch this for a while, and you notice those poles are not 
stationary. They grow and they collapse. And so this is a kind of billowing tent where the poles are going up and down. Everybody still with me? I'm almost there. I need one more step and then I, I'll tell you why the heck I'm talking about all this. And then you watch for some more time and you realize those poles are not stationary, not just in the y-axis, they're not just going up and down. But on a much slower time scale, they're trying to inch up in various directions. They're trying to move in various directions. And therefore, because the terrain is uneven, some go down into a valley as they move, some move up. And so the tent is also slowly moving away and, and its shape is changing as you move. All right? And then you realize the hillside is dotted with these tents, none of whom are close to the top. They're all very much close to the bottom, and they're just kind of going up. Everybody still with me? OK. Uh, that was more than I expected, so thank you. <laughs> I hadn't tried the metaphor before. But here's the metaphor. The poles stand for your right tail people, the people who attract other people to come around them. And they could be teachers, researchers, institution builders, whatever. Occasionally a glorified bureaucrat like me. Right? And the fabric is the rest of the community. The alumni, the institution. And everybody gets pulled up when one of the poles goes up. But it does sag in some other places. And as you explore, some things go down and up. Right? So this is my kind of running metaphor for the talk, and I'd like to organize all the feedback, or all the dialogue, rather, that has taken place here in three categories, using this as the metaphor. So the first thing is you don't know where the poles are, and so you've got to take a risk on something that will grow into a tall pole. So the first theme of my talk is risk. And by risk, I'm a business school professor. For me, risk is not bad. Risk is simply risk, right? And you actually want an optimal level of risk. It's part of how, if you went to a portfolio and I had, which had almost no risk in it, you'd fire the portfolio manager, right? You need to take an optimal amount of risk. And one of the risks you do is betting on people, the polls, right? You hope they will grow up, and you don't know which one of those will grow. And so you have to kind of, in some sense, make sure the poles are as broadly spread as possible, and you try as often as possible to get a pole to grow, to keep the average tent height high. So risk is something that you should pay attention to. And in fact, I would like to put you know, slightly stretch Professor Ranganathan's uh, uh, statement yesterday. He quoted the beautiful lines from Wordsworth. Bliss was it in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. He didn't tell you why Wordsworth wrote those lines. Wordsworth wrote those lines because he was so enthusiastic about the start of the French Revolution. And you must ask yourself, can this institution create beauty without risk? And so the first thing the alumni would like to stand behind you is as your insurance company to the extent that we can. In particular, you have taken a substantial risk. I know I'm going to be one more of the people that is going to embarrass Professor Balram. There is no doubt the undergraduate program is a risk. There is just no doubt about it. And by risk, again, remember, it's not derogatory for me. It's very positive. And because undergraduate programs have this tendency to be tails that wag dogs, you already saw in the question answer session, Professor Ranganathan, among others, saying, why aren't you teaching them humanities? And God forbid, someday somebody is going to say, why don't you teach them economics? Right? And then you'll have people like me in the building. Right? This is a, uh, and so you have to think that this is a risk, but it's one word taken. And to the extent that we can provide insurance, not just by hiring those students, but by perhaps helping them set aspiration. For me, I owe, and I say this without the least bit of insincerity, I owe practically everything that I am to the Indian Institute of Science. Thank you. And I owe it for one simple reason. 
it showed me what I could aspire to. I didn't achieve it, but at least it showed me what I could aspire to. And that is not something to be taken lightly. What you teach is less important than how you teach people to aspire. And therefore, you are sowing the seeds of the poles that will come and join and hold up your tent. If you ask how have the alumni helped the institute, and occasionally I get questions like that. That's the kind of the stupidest question you can ask. How many of your illustrious faculty are your alumni? Right? You've already been in the tent pole creation business. And this will help in that to a significant extent. And but it has its risks. If you don't get it right, you know, among other initiatives, the HRD ministry may start paying attention. And that may not be a, that may not always be possible. Oh geez, we are on camera. I withdraw that statement. <laughs> So alumni can help with students on many dimensions, and you have already heard various specifics on that. But think of us as your insurance policy as you take this. Here's another way in which we could be a, your insurance policy. You want to try something, and you're not yet quite ready to write a proposal. You have no idea how it will turn out. In fact, you should have a healthy supply of people walking into your office saying, I want to try X, and I have no, F, well, no bleeping clue what it's going to turn out to be. right? And, uh, and that's, that's actually a good state of affairs, because that means you're taking risks. And you want to have, for example, resources that you can allocate to things like that. So yeah, knock yourself out. Go try it. Doesn't work out fine. Well, now try something else. And that is something the alumni can help with. We might be willing to co-invest as equity holders rather than as debt holders. In the if you wanna, that is, we are willing to share the risk with you. And that is something you should take advantage of. That's the other way in which so as both insurance as well as equity holders do think of us. The second one is, if you look at my own institution and how it got better, it got better to through two two ways. Uh, two ways. One was the short-sightedness of other individuals. People were chased out of various parts of Europe. And they tended to settle in Chicago, and that helped us. We picked up a few people. Chandrasekhar was one. Enrico Fermi was an example of somebody else we picked up. And uh, you know Saunders McLean. There's a list is long. We picked up a bunch of people that way. That's that's serendipity, and we've already been admonished that that's not a strategy for growth. So what else can we do? The social sciences at the University of Chicago has a chip on its shoulder. It has a chip on its shoulder because it was ignored by one of, one of the course for a long time. That chip of our shoulder is our distinctiveness. We look under every rock. We are kind of the epitome of empiricism. I don't know, you know if you know the joke about Ernst Mach. Mach was eating at high table in Cambridge, and somebody said, it's windy today. Mark got up, disappeared for a while, came back, sat down, and said yes. Right? <laughs> he had verified the hypothesis, of course. That's very much my lunchroom. The first response to anything you say, and it's quite tiring, by the way, even the crossword is that way. I do the crossword in the lunchroom. And people say, why is that the answer? Because it fits. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so th that is our, our chip on our shoulder is our distinctiveness. So, Institutions, as they climb, do need to have distinctiveness. And if the word is global, and this is the first time, probably, hopefully, the only time I'll be a teeny bit insolent. And please forgive me in advance for that. So trying to be global, top in India, is neither here nor there. Right? If you're global, you're global. You play in, a, you play in the other field. If you are playing in the other field, you do need distinctiveness. What could be distinctiveness? For me, another risk you've taken could be an example of the distinctiveness. Chalekere may have potential. Imagine, I suspect, although I'm not entirely certain, that string theorists may feel, maybe I should do something occasionally that has immediate value. Right? I'm not, by the way, I'm not dissing string theory. I, I, I don't know anything about it. Uh, and so why not I offer the following workshop? 
string theory in the morning, teach physics to high school teachers in the afternoon. How, maybe this is the destination for scientists who care. So you th I, I, I'm not claiming that's a prescription. I'm merely saying that's an example where we can be your sales force. We can be crass as alumni to go tell people, so you go to Cold Spring Harbor because the fishing's good, but you won't go to India and teach high school teachers? You can't do that. You are respectable people. I'm only a bureaucrat. I can. Right? So think about it. Use us. You use us well. We can be your ambassadors, provided you're willing to receive who we sell this thing to. That was the second thing, or oh, this collaboration, interaction, etc. I think imagination beyond MOUs may be called for. And again, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not, I don't even claim to practice what I'm preaching. But like any good teacher, this is more fun. As you know. The final one I want to talk about, and I've already gone over, I apologize to the chair that I've already gone over my 15 minutes, but I will stop soon enough. Uh, wonderful. My third one also has been covered. The distinctiveness has been talked about. And the third one I want to talk about is leverage. And leverage is also talked about. In fact, Professor Padmanabhan yesterday talked about projection and translation. Those were the words he used in his talk. I use a more broader term called leverage. And by leverage, I mean exactly the simple machine's interpretation of leverage, which is if you put in a little bit here, the other end must move a lot. Right? That's basically all I'm saying with leverage. And, and what are examples of leverage? One is, and we found this out for ourselves, our biggest leverage was not so much if going out and saying the external world is important for us for its own sake, but as a way of realizing the external world is a way to have one kind of immediate impact. Think of entrepreneurship not as the way to get rich, even though that helps, and I don't knock it, but think of it as the way by which something that within a government lab will be made in sizes of 80 will get made in sizes of 80 million, because lots of other people will get involved. And if you think of it that way, rather than asking for a government agency to roll it out, asking for the market to roll it out, this is simply a normal way of tossing applicable research over the transit. But you don't even have to do that. We started a magazine called Capital Ideas. And all that Capital Ideas did was to use good people. We hired the Midwest editor of the Financial Times to run the magazine. And the reason we hired him was simple. We needed to translate economics to English. Right? That was it. Turns out it's very valuable do that. Uh, and science to English, you don't have to do it. In fact, I'm amazed. I wish I had faculty like yours. There are like 5,000 cells here, and everybody's got a faculty director. They'd, they'd lynch me if I tried that. We have one dean, four deputy deans, 200 faculty. We don't have department heads. We can't get people to sign up. <laughs> right? We've got an administration of five people on a tenure line. Well, we have a PhD director, so six. Sorry, I lied. And so you can use us, the alumni, staff, etc., as resources in doing this cut work. We know it's cut work for you. It doesn't add value to your life. It's intellectually demeaning. Fine, we get it. Use us. We'll do this cut work for you. We'll translate for you. Assume and you can check to make sure we got it right. Right? So that's another way. We can help with dissemination, should you be interested. That's another way in which the alumni can help. The other way we can help is, for example, take fundraising. And assuming, and I know that the director has set up a fundraising cell, and I applaud him for that. Assuming you do go down that path with full vigor, going down that path takes money. Nobody will pay, give you money to raise money. We will. We are your alumni. So you can use us in that way as well. So I would like to now summarize uh, and
wonderful. The song and dance show is getting worse. Okay. And the search for continued eminence is like a tent that's crawling up a very rocky uneven terrain. It's pulling in all directions, and you gotta let it that way. One of my trustees once told me about describing my institution, he said, this asylum only works if you let the inmates run it. I firmly believe that. You can't be prescriptive on which way is up. You have to let the institution find that out for itself. But we got to get the caterpillar to move teeny bit and say, if you go in a hole, we'll out, at least to the extent we can. That's the first thing. The second is this distinctiveness, light the tent. Let people know that your tent is a different color than other people's. And finally, if you can get other people to buy a telescope, leverage, please do. So that's the end of my metaphor. I, I admit it was weak, but uh, hey, I was trying to scientists, not poets. So weak metaphors would survive. And uh, so I'd like to stop here and repeat. I know I should have picked something from the Gita or something, but I'm. I'm going to pick something instead, which is genuinely Midwestern, where I'm from, from the Lutheran sermon. And it says, people in the congregation are required to give time, talent, and treasure to the church. To me, this is my church. I'm happy to give. And of course, my mouth's way bigger than my wallet. But I'm happy to give time, talent, and treasure to the Indian School of Science, and I know all of you are too. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, what we will do is we will hear Professor Ushavijay Raghavan, then I will request both the speakers to come back onto the stage uh, so that they can answer your questions at that time. This session uh, should close around between 2.45 and 2.50 so that the Alumni Association of North America will give away some awards before the tea time. So I would, Professor Usha Vijay Raghavan is professor in the Department of Microbiology and Cell Biology. She's a very distinguished molecular biologist and uh, she will, she's also now responsible for the international relations of the institute. you must have had a wonderful time coming and spending uh, a few days at IISC, your alma mater, and invigorating yourself with all the new activities on this campus. Um, so today I talked to you a very brief talk on um, the initiatives at IISC to be international, where we are, how we want to go, and uh, I'll structure my talk in that direction. So as uh, all of you already know this is like uh, talking to the converted. Um, thinking in academic excellence, uh, scientific excellence, bringing scientific excellence to bear on problems has been the thing that ISC has been doing locally for century, more than a century. Right? But this actually has been impacting in a very quiet sort of way, has had global impact, and much more than we really appreciate uh, it, this is the time for us to be actually celebrating that, and this is also the time for us to be taking this to even uh, greater heights. So the mission to be at the top was not something that uh, we conjectured in the centenary year or even uh, recently. It's something that even our uh, visionary founder had. One of our uh, visionary founders' statement is that IISC must be the world's foremost academic institution 
through the pursuit of excellence and promotion and innovation. So this was the vision more than a century ago, and this still remains what motivates IISC to be uh, the best. Um, so just a very brief uh, snapshot of what this institute is about right now. Um, we have an enviable ratio of uh, six students to one faculty, something that is a fantastic ratio that we provide to our students, accessibility to a large pool of mostly graduate students who are PhD students, uh, masters in engineering, and a small but very, very invigorating group of undergraduates, a total number of about 425 or so, and you've heard a couple of them, and it's really heartwarming uh, to hear about their success stories, and I think they're gonna go further. So in this scenario of about six to one, primarily graduate-driven research with a little bit of undergraduate teaching, the international students are a very, very small pool. So we have, if you look at the 2014 data, we have about 50 international students, that's about it. So uh, what uh, is this international relations about, and since when does IISC's international relation figure as a real unit? So amongst the various establishments and administrative units at IISC, this is a very, very recent unit set up in 1998. And as most international units do, uh, there are many activities which relate to signing MOUs. Like Dr. Sunil just pointed out, MOU is good, but MOU is rarely the one which is going to achieve everything. What you need is the people who will drive the concepts that are built in that MOU. Um, the other thing that we have are faculty exchanges, we have collaborations, delegations, delegations which range from people who are uh, governmental uh, heads in science and technology policy to, you know, um, scientists wanting to participate in a very focused manner with the talent that we have at IISC, both at the faculty and at the student level. Um, principally, everything revolves around what can we teach and what kind of research can we do that is both locally relevant and globally impactful. So like any top university must have, they must be linked with the others of the same kind. You learn from each other and uh, intellect actually grows from such collaborations. So it's, it's, it's a who's who of many universities with whom we have MOUs, be it in uh, the United States of America, in Munich, in uh, Australia, in Auckland, in so on. So to give an idea of whether these partnerships have already helped us in good measure. So we measure uh, whether such collaborations, informal, sometimes structured, sometimes totally coincidental, and sometimes sought after collaborations, have they actually borne us success? Uh, even by just sampling the Division of Biological Sciences where I'm from, you can see that if you look at where do we you know, interact with and which countries do we publish with in top ranking journals, it's very clear that we're doing all right. We are publishing with people who are similarly extremely able in the topics of their research. So United States, France, Europe, etc. In many of these instances, such collaborations are actually funded by joint grants. So this is another measure of us being competitive in a global scenario in attracting funds to concepts and ideas that we must explore in the global platform. So we have many of our faculty with joint grants with France, the European Union, USA, Australia, but a larger number are small mobility grants which are funded by intergovernmental organizations. So what about IISC? In addition to us tapping into the little amount of resources which are available through governmental and intergovernmental platforms, IISC took the initiative some time ago, about five, six years ago, to actually put in its own resources to have an international student exchange program, and that is the ISEP program. And this principally gives a little bit of support for IISC students to visit and work in the laboratories where their collaborators are present. And this has been really a cascading effect on the research actually progressing to higher levels. But this number is highly, highly limited. The second thing that we provide is local hospitality and uh, availability of resources over here, 
for students who want to come and study here. So we have a snapshot of the kind of mobility of people coming from different parts of the world over here. And if you look at a two-year period, we have students coming in from Germany, from USA, from Sweden, from uh, Spain, coming to do coursework here or to do research in their chosen topic of uh, analysis. Of course, scripted by the success of whatever uh, things their professors are doing at their respective institutions. So this is a happening and good thing and we need to foster it. How do we make this little pole grow so the tent grows up? Coming back to the metaphor that we just heard a little bit earlier. Now, again, an example of just the kind of interactions that we've had with the United States of America, we've had students visiting from Brandeis over here, spending a whole semester doing coursework over here. So these are typically sophomore and junior undergrads from Brandeis who come and choose to study their entire one semester of coursework here. And the reciprocal advantage is for our students who are from the undergraduate program get chosen to do internships at Brandeis. So their summer internships of our students are complemented by coursework of the Brandeis students. So that's a wonderful example that we can use to build such complementarities with other institutions elsewhere. We have fantastic research collaborations with many laboratories. I'll show an example later on. But this is just a snapshot of what's happened in 2014. With France, we have a long-standing multidisciplinary interaction which spreads all over in all disciplines of mathematics, in physics, in biology, in engineering. And this has uh, resulted in exchange programs from almost every province in France university having a tie-up with us over here, and students coming to study here or do their research work over here. Um, similarly, if re very recently in Australia, there was a special, with Australia, the Indian government through DST set up the Strategic Research Fund, which is AISCRF, and the Department of Biotechnology put in uh, Indo-Australia Biotechnology funding, both in double-digit crores, and this has paid dividends in us being able to partner with top universities in Australia provide for a little bit of mobility of students as well as for enhancing our own research and providing time and space for the Australian scientists to come and spend time at IISC. So all of this has helped in a little bit of the mobility program. So this is a good thing that's happening and I'm looking to hear from the alumni uh, of IISC both from their purse and their heart to open out and help this little fledgling thing fly. And I'm sure this is, this is not only a good thing to do, it's also the necessary thing to do because science is truly global. There's nothing about doing science in Bangalore which is any better than doing science in San Diego or doing this in Albuquerque or doing this in the middle of the Australian desert. It's the question that matters and putting the right minds together will really help towards that. Some of the big time collaborations that have happened in the last uh, 15 years deserve a mention. And because they are examples for us to use to build other big uh, enterprises of collaborative nature. So one of the very successful things is the Indo-French water cell, which was set up in 2001 with uh, complementary funding from the French research government and uh, the Indian government. And this, in 2010, has become a joint laboratory and is now in its second phase. And this, uh, this particular center has been running strong for now more than a decade and is in the 15th or 16th year of funding. What, do they, uh, what is their broad goal? Their broad goal is to look at the impact of human and environmental and uh, impact on water. Water, hydrology, the interaction between the continent, the ocean, and the uh, land resources, water available from every particular scale, be it the geology, be it the hydrology, be it urban management, be it agricultural utilization, every end of it is being looked at uh, by the French water cell. It's a leading example of how one can actually build a laboratory which is truly international. We have French scientists who are hosted here and their primary location is in Bangalore. The other very recent thing which has happened and is a lovely success story is the Indo-US Solar Energy Center uh, called the CERIUS, which is the Solar Energy Research Institute for India and the United States. So this system 
of putting $50 million, multiple partners, both in R&D laboratories, in universities, and private uh, research R&D function, uh, groups function together to provide solutions, be it photovoltaic cells, to energy distribution, to smart storage of energy and what have you. This is a new center that has started in 2012 and will be co-running to 2015 with $50 million from multiple sources. The exchange program of Brand, as I already mentioned, and another lovely success story is a, is a program that's developing with the right companies. So what are the ingredients for this successful partnership? Um, many of the times, it usually begins with a focused research workshop. A workshop where people actually discover each other from two different places, find complementarities, and then take it to bilateral pro funding programs, which are mobility programs, and then aim for big research programs. So we have, for France, there is the Indo-French uh, Center for the Promotion of Advanced Research. For Germany, we have the DAD. UK, we have UK ERI. We have the Australia Fund, um, the Indo-US Science and Technology Forum, the DST NWO, and many, many more intergovernment programs. But these are usually the start points of uh, excellent research, and this needs a champion at both sides to shepherd it through many, many rounds of selection. The other thing that IIC has started, and which really needs to uh, get a big boost and catalyst, is we now, it's not been advertised very well, and it needs a better uh, pitching. We have a full-time resident PhD scholar program. So IIC provides five-year full funding for an international PhD student, international of nationality, to come and do their entire PhD studies rooted right here at the Indian Institute of Science. So this uh, is a program which is steadily growing. Started only in 2010, when the one or two students, stray students, came through the Ministry of Cultural Exchange or whatever. So they just sort of drifted in here by accident. But the targeted approach of advertising through our website, etc. The number is growing, and we have a steady number of about 12 to 15 students who are international students working for their full-time PhD in IISC with funding provided from here. So we have also a complement of a two-year residence period for the masters. So this is another program which would be fantastic if we could take it further. So how do we build on these small initiatives that we are doing to go beyond our local impact to something which would be global? It's necessary to be global. It's necessary for us to stay current and build our global reputation. Number one, the easiest thing is to tell people who we are and what we are. Even that needs a better articulation, and that's something that we can do. But what will help from your side is to spread the word, as it were, and make sure that students and scientists at your organizations know of your capac of capacity of your alma mater. So there is no doubt that many organizations, you know, my where I studied from, they don't hesitate to send me a card saying even a dollar from you, Usha, would go a long way. And I'm addressed by my first word, first, first name. And every time I get a letter from the president of the organization, and every time I get a letter from people reach out and ask, we can do that, but it would be nice if the IIC Alumni Association of North America is the bridge which helps us to reach out to our alumni and make you to contribute to the growth of our next generation of scientists. So we need to augment, publicize, and attract foreign faculty. I must admit that there are very, very few of them. This is one method by which we can actually make our visibility grow. We have two potential uh, mechanisms for this. One is uh, philanthropic organizations in India itself supporting such funding. And the Infosys Foundation has put in place two international professor chairs in mathematics and physics. And we would love to have top ranking scientists and professors spend time here with no financial uh, strings whatsoever, with exactly the same sort of pay structure that they have in their parent organization. So residents over here for top class people would be lovely. And very, very recently, the Christian Sudha Gopalakrishnan Foundation has put in three chairs in computational neuroscience and neurosensory model research. And this is another sort of thing where philanthropic organizations in India are putting in to bring top-notch people over here. So we need to replicate this. And we need to replicate this at least one in every division, if not in every department. 
because there are excellent people out there who, by spending residence time here, are going to help us to uh, project ourselves globally. Now I'm going to come back to that little point of risk that Dr. Sunil Kumar mentioned. So there's the risk, C funds for IIS faculty. A tiny idea which would be by long shot something that any organization would not fund. But it is something that an organization or two organizations are willing to put in money on. This is something that can help and build new career paths, not only for the students of this institute, but also for postdocs that can happen. So can we set up a seed fund? MIT has it. So MIT has an uh, international science and technology initiative where they provide seed funds necessarily for MIT graduates to engage with international so that we need to hedge our bets on the right people we need to put the risk where where there is some chance of winning and this chance of winning will happen if we partner the right people to in both places um, top quality international students we have made a small start in this direction but we need to go a long way how is it that I can make a Caltech undergrad say that you know what I want to go to my graduate school in the Indian Institute of Science and work on a problem that bridges California and Chalakere campus. How do we bring them here? Can we actually now put in metrics to score people for their compatibility for such large problems, which requires them to take a big leap of faith and come here? So here's another risk, and we need people who will catalyze this from both ends of the spectrum, that is, in the other country as well as here. Uh, postdoctoral programs, because these will be the ones who will be the ambassadors for future science. Anybody who comes and does a postdoc in the United States of America or studies in France or in Sweden at the Karolinska always will remember that experience and build on that for the future. So these are ways in which we can engage and it will be great to have the Alumni Association of the world of IISC contribute to this. So we act locally. We have been impacting globally in a very, very quiet way and a very unrecognized way. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to do this in a much more uh, publicly and a grander scale. Thank you all. Let's see something. You relax. You know, unfortunately, the director, Professor Anurag Kumar, is not able to be here. And I'll just remind you of the slides that he projected uh, when he made his address on the first day. In a session which is entitled Reaching the Top, Professor Sunil Kumar reminded us that we must define the top. And I think the top as defined in the director's presentation was really based on the current global ranking schemes which he discussed. I would remind you that there are three global ranking schemes. The ARW rankings or the Shanghai rankings which he mentioned. The Times Higher Education or THE rankings. And the third, the QS rankings. All these rankings come out around this time of the year. And the moment they come out this time of the year, they are immediately picked up in the press and the very next day they will be on the first pages of papers like the Times of India or the Indian Express. They lament year after year by everyone from the President of India, Mr. Pranav Mukherjee, former Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh, present Prime Minister Mr. Narendra Modi, and India's most distinguished scientist, Professor C.N.R. Rao, every year will be how bad Indian institutions are doing. We will also be told that there is no Indian institution which is in the top 100. There is, in fact, no Indian institution in the top 200. Then we will set for ourselves a vision. And that vision will be that in five years we will be in the top 50. Now, those of you who are familiar with soccer, football, will realize that if we decide that India is now going to get into the finals of the World Cup, 
it isn't going to be very easy. It's going to be a very, very long haul. And it's a game in which the rules need to be understood, the game needs to be understood, and the game also needs to be encouraged in the country. Therefore, when we look at rankings, and we will look at them every day, this morning's Times of India had yet another article which appeared in Nature, which said that India is doing poorer in science than Kenya. Why is India doing poorer in science than in Kenya? Because any index that you have, and all of you are scientists, and today even social scientists use so much of mathematics, it turns out that there is a numerator and a denominator. And very often the denominator that is there in these indices is the population of the country. And there, of course, India has a very, very large denominator. So when one asks the question that an institution has to reach the top, we have to really ask ourselves, the what is the environment in which the institution is embedded? What is the process of evolution of institutions? The University of Chicago Professor Sunil Kumar reminded us is a young university. It is a young university when you compare it with Harvard, when you compare it with Oxford, when you compare it with Cambridge. By that measure, the Indian Institute of Science is an even younger university. But in India, the Indian Institute of Science is one of India's oldest institutions. How has the institute evolved over a century? How has the century treated the institute? How has the century treated the country? Is something that we must all remember. Otherwise, we will not be able to address this question of improving Indian institutions in any measure. But I will come back to the present. I will come back to the present to tell you some things of the kinds of difficulties which any director of the Indian Institute of Science is likely to face in the future. He will face, unfortunately, Professor Anurag Kumar is not here, but my sympathies are with him. Because he will be asked this question. Sometimes the newspapers will not even read the ranking schemes correctly because they, most of the people who write in the newspapers have great difficulty reading on the internet. You will suddenly have a sub-editor headlining, and the Times of India did it some time ago, that the Indian Institute of Science has dropped 120 positions in the Shanghai rankings. Did it really drop 120 positions? You can go and click into the Shanghai rankings and find that it didn't drop 120 positions. But one thing you might remember, that in 2003, when the Shanghai rankings came out first, there were three Indian institutions on that list, the Indian Institute of Science and two of the IITs. Now, 10 years later, there's only one Indian institution on the list, that is the Indian Institute of Science. This is because today, in the competitive world of university rankings, you have to run very, very hard to stay in the same place. It's going to be very, very difficult to overtake others who put in greater resources, have greater public support, have greater governmental support, have greater support from their environments. How does an institution function in India? This is a question that the alumni, those of you who come, today it turns out that Indians living abroad appear to have a greater influence on the policy of the government of India than Indians who live in India. And this has been for quite some time. Rallies held in Madison Square Garden are likely to have far more influence than any kind of meeting which is held at the Indian Institute of Science. So I would address those of you who have come from North America to remember that your influence extends very far. It is not only your purse, but also your positions. The places that you occupy in universities which are higher up in the rankings than the Indian Institute of Science. So your word will count. It is there that you must stand up and speak for your institution to tell the powers that be how important it is to support institutions which have survived under very difficult conditions for over half a century. Today I heard in the session that just ended a discussion on the undergraduate program of the Institute. And this Professor Ranganathan lauded as a great initiative. This Professor Sunil Kumar 
said was a calculated risk and of course one needs to take calculated risks in order to go up the what I might call the ladder of public perception. How did the government of India react to the undergraduate program? They did not know that the undergraduate program existed at the Indian Institute of Science. But when the undergraduate program ran into a political storm because it was created at Delhi University, the very term four-year undergraduate program now appeared to have a very bad connotation. And political and public pressure was in fact brought upon universities now to change their name and sometimes to curtail the program. What is most interesting about this sphere of higher education and research is that every political party in India is probably doing its little bit to downgrade the sphere of higher education and research. The only thing on which the Aam Aadmi Party and the BJP agreed in the Delhi elections was that the Delhi University's four-year undergraduate program was bad. And by implication, the four-year undergraduate program anywhere else in the country was in fact bad. There was no discussion on what the academic merits of the four-year undergraduate program were. Why was the four-year undergraduate program actually started here? Four-year undergraduate program was started here to do an experiment in higher education. Engineering programs, if all of you will remember, were five years. They were then cut to four. When they were cut to four, science programs were not cut from three plus two to four. They remained as three plus two. So this argument that we heard in the morning was a fallacious argument. Four-year courses in engineering were labeled as professional courses. Every other course of a higher education in India then by implication is unprofessional. This is not the way higher education is supposed to proceed in a country. Therefore, I believe that the Indian Institute of Science is the only institution which can in fact carry out these experiments and still have the very fact that it is the best institution in India still counts for something that it is still permitted to run its program, albeit with a different name. So you must then remember the constraints under which institutions work. I would also remind you that funding for science is going down in India. Today, the Indian economy isn't as good as it should be. There isn't that much money coming in to Indian institutions. This has not been so for the last two years almost. Therefore, we are in for a more difficult time in the future, so we must be very realistic in looking at directions which reach the top. It is not enough to have visions. Visions can very often turn into nightmares. And therefore, we must be very pragmatic in addressing where we want to go, how we want to go, how are we going to raise the resources for doing so. Yesterday's newspaper also had Mr. Raghuram Rajan, also I believe from Chicago, reminding us that a global recession is probably on the horizon. No global recession is going to leave India untouched and therefore institutions will have to tighten their belts, they will have to find other ways of raising resources and they will then depend on a much larger group of well-wishers to come to their support. So it is one thing to have a session which is entitled Reaching the Top. What I would like to remind you is, yesterday I saw Professor Ranganathan's lecture sitting at home on the computer because I could not come here and there I saw that he had listed all the directors down from Professor Satish Thavan. I think over the last 50 years, I believe, that every director of this institution, including me, has always wanted this institution to rise to the top. Even before the global rankings, we would have been like to be counted with the best in the world. But at every stage, in every decade, 
whether it was the decade of the 50s or the 60s or the 70s, all the way to the present, there have been constraints. These constraints must be recognized. Institutions are a product of their evolutionary history. This is something that you must remember. Many years ago, the biologist Jabzansky said that nothing in biology makes sense except in the right of evolution. But nothing in human affairs also makes sense except in the light of history. Therefore, I would urge all of you to think about this a little bit and never blame the existing administration for any time you see a report in the newspaper that they have gone down in the rankings or they have gone up in the rankings. Neither can an administration take the credit for it, neither should it take the blame. Also, remember that in India, it has been much, much easier to build institutions than to maintain them at the level they were a few years after they started. More of our institutions, including my own alma mater, IIT Kanpo, are a shadow of what they once were. Those of you who may have studied, the older people who may have studied in universities, Banaras Hindu University, Madras University, Calcutta University, Delhi University, all of them were centers of learning, but they have not remained. Building institutions in India is like climbing a steep ladder. Unfortunately, it's also a game of snakes and ladders, because at every step, there are snakes which will then pull you down. That, in fact, has been the story of the interference of the Indian political system in higher education. And therefore, since we cannot be completely divorced from the system, we must learn to live with the system and learn how to utilize the system in order to at least stay where we are. Nobody has asked a question yet in this session. I will ask the first one and I'm going to ask it of the audience and you will answer. How many of you agree that the Indian Institute of Science is an institute of national importance? I find that there is almost unanimous agreement. This is what in the Lok Sabha we would say passed by a voice vote. But it actually turns out that the Indian Institute of Science is not an institute of national importance. It is an institute of national importance in public perception. But it is not an institute of national importance as decreed by the Parliament of India because there is no act by which the Indian Institute of Science came into being. It existed before Parliament. It continued to exist after independence. Therefore, today, the Indian Institutes of Management, the Indian Institutes of Technology are in fact institutes of national importance. But there is a danger in being an institute of national importance because then you have an Act of Parliament. Who drafts Acts of Parliament? Acts of Parliament are drafted by politicians and bureaucrats and once an Act is passed by Parliament then it becomes law. And once it becomes law anything that you do is likely to be violative of the law. Therefore the Institute, you will hear the discussions on the IIMs today. So the Institute has survived in this kind of below the radar uh, sort of situation as far as the central government has been concerned. And the one thing that alumni, faculty, students, everybody must realize, and all well-wishers of our institutions, that we need to preserve and protect our institutions and preservation and protection must in fact sometimes precede even the aspirations and ambitions that we have to reach the top. I will stop at this point and ask you now to address your questions to the panelists. We could have about five to seven minutes of questions. When uh, Cambridge started the molecular research unit, they believed they will get four or five Nobel Prizes. They got many more. Can we identify a few areas here where the institute is likely to get the Nobel Prize 
given adequate support. Uh, I, I, I am retired, so I should not. <laughs> Thank you for putting me on the spot. <laughs> well, we always uh, stand on the shoulders of giants. So, <laughs> so um, now that I'm supposedly the only person on the dais for administration, I hope all my colleagues in the back will back me up. So I'm not sure that, it, it, that an institute should aspire to be excellent only by uh, putting a Nobel as, as their benchmark. But if it were to be one of, the, one of the things that we should aspire towards, I think our, um, our uh, faculties are the ones to decide on what areas that they excel in. And by being excellent in that area, you're going to drive that area of growth. So I don't think that an institution would decide that we are going to start a center with the idea that we're going to get a Nobel in this particular discipline. What is it that we're inherently good at? I think we're inherently good at in any quantitative aspect of science. We're inherently good at quantitative aspects of science as they're applicable to engineering science. So it could happen in any discipline. Now in the global scenario, what are the, where is all the excitement happening? My bias would be to say that they're happening at the fringes between the silos of uh, traditional sciences. So in the silos, uh, what I mean is physics, chemistry, mathematics, biology uh, would be the traditional fundamental sciences. And it's in the fringes between these that there's a lot of excitement going on. So if the institute has the purse, either from the government or from the magnanimity of uh, your well-wishers and donors, then it is in these fringe areas that there's going to be exciting work which is done. So whether it is computational biology, mathematics, or big data analysis, beginning from astrophysics to genomic sciences, these are areas in which discoveries can be made. And we should be positioned to address them. Yeah, I might just add something to what Usha said. See, one area in the rankings where I think the alumni has let us down very badly is that they haven't won Nobel Prizes in Fields Medics. I would like to address my question to Usha. The international program is very important. The international program is very important. And once upon a time, Professor Balram wrote that uh, he had been given a choice to become a historian. I'm becoming more and more of a historian. When as a divisional chairman, we used to sign these MOUs, we were quite happy to leave that room immediately so that we can go back to other jobs. Then I suggested to the institute, they must have one professor in charge of international relations, and Professor Ishwaran was appointed at that time to look after that. Right. Then we had the international relations cell. I'm happy now that there's an international relations office. But even the international relations office is kind of subsumed under development and alumni affairs. The office designation I see is uh, DOAA. I don't find the international relations. I would like to suggest that you secede from that office and set it up separately. It's very, very important. It's far yes. too important. Because I want to reverse the question that we are asking. Why are we not reaching the top? Actually, we should wonder why we came down from the top. India invented the university system. Nalanda and Taxila were the first universities of the world. And they had students from China, from Tibet, and other Middle East, and other places. They are full of people. Of course, Buddhism was a major attraction. And the scientists who were working there, the teachers who were working there, at some of the finest, by teaching that subject for humanities, I understood how wonderful these places are. And there is one famous book by Tuan Song, who came to India and wrote a book called Journey to the West. People might think West means United States and UK and so on. That is what it means to most of us. But the Chinese, it meant India. They saw leadership here. I feel, though it is true, by offering professorships and having collaboration projects, you can increase international movement. The reputation of the faculty here and their collaborations, which they had established their years, that is what is going to bring the international faculty. And I would like to say, the programs you talked about are all, if I may say so, Eurocentric. I don't find China or Korea, which have come up so well. China goes a very long way in attracting people from other countries. I, I may be mistaken because it's all well looking at the slides and drawings and conclusions. I do feel you must also look east, as I said sometimes.
so I'll leave aside the uh, seceding part, but uh, towards looking east, I think drawn in there, we have very active collaborations with Japan. Uh, Tohoku University, the Japan uh, Institute for Advanced Scientific Research, Meiji University. Um, I don't know whether we have official engagements with China. Uh, my predecessors at the international office are all sitting right behind you. They can correct me. Uh, but it's not that we are no, not looking east or west. I completely agree with you that what needs to be built is everything depends upon the faculty and the students of the institute. They need to be the ones which are world class. So recruiting and retaining the best is really, really what being a top class institute is about. About India having lost out in uh, centuries ago, I think uh, that's a historian's perspective. Uh, industrial resolution, industrial revolution. India missed out that entire wave. So now is the time of all the digital revolution and so on. Maybe we will be back up there. Sir, why should we care for global ranking? Let's work quietly towards excellence. All of us are very good people here. Let's work quietly towards excellence. And just as Satyarthi recently won the Nobel Prize for working quietly amongst children, for 30, 40 years he worked, he got recognized one day, he got the Nobel Prize. We will get the Nobel Prize one day when we develop our infrastructure. Let's build toilets, let's build low cost housing, let's develop the country. Once the economy improves, the global ranking of uh, Indian student science also will improve. So we'll have to contribute towards basic effort towards improving infrastructure in the country. Thank you. I think this could be the last question because we are running out of time. Uh, I must congratulate Professor Bala for an excellent analysis of what is the position. The only point which perhaps I differ is we don't have to worry about the media at all because nobody believes them because they have <laughs> lost their credibility. But we do have to worry about the politicians. So that is one major problem. But otherwise, the institute is the top because of the product from you. The scientists and engineers who have gone out all over the world and they stand with themselves with great achievement, a position, that is a reflection on the capability of the institution. If this can be continued, we don't have to worry about Nobel Prize also. Nobel Prize may come, may not come. But our fundamental research and the talent growing is the thing which we have to concentrate on. Don't worry about the global positioning because they are depending on so many factors which are irrelevant to us and which will not be able to meet. It's my question. Last question. Uh, thank you, the senior people. But I just, I just want to add few of my thought in that regard. The ranking is important in the sense that the money you get from your government depends on the ranking. People see your ranking in your newspaper and your money Means we are running out of money now, we know, in the institute. The way we do science now has changed that we were due to do in 50 years back. We need huge machines that cost much money. We have to buy it. For that, we have to have global ranking. Somehow it is, somehow it is visible and it helps in getting the money from the government. Sec I, I think we should uh, wind up the session because Alumni Association of North America wants to uh, give away the awards. So if anyone has one last question addressed to Professor Sunil Kumar oh, and not okay. to either no, of no, us. <laughs> okay, if there are no f further questions, uh, let me thank Professor Sunil Kumar and Professor Usha Vijay Raghavan for that excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. ask you to be on the stand by us again. Thank you.
So good afternoon. Uh, uh, I'm given 10 minutes time, and I'll try to make it uh, a, in 10 minutes or shorter. Uh, here we go. Uh, uh, da, 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 if I get it. So this is. Uh, oh yeah, here we are. Okay. So this is. This is about. Uh, do you have a, a point of this? This is about saying thanks uh, to the people who have uh, done a lot to the Indian Institute of Science Alumni Association of North America. Uh, what? Oh, full screen. Sorry. Okay, good, good, good. And uh, let me briefly introduce myself. I'm Murthy Guri Party, working at JPL, uh, 8186 Organic Chemistry, including to get class with Balram. Uh, and uh, I uh, am one of the founding members of the Indian Institute of Science Alumni Association with the goal of giving back. And the rest of it we left alone. Everyone can do it, as Sunil said. You can do it by money, you can do it by your time, or you can do it by your goodwill. So, so then, as you do that, we want to also just say thank you back uh, to our members. So this is what our goal is. And IAC Anna says thank you for that. And we also have our bylaws under which we do it. We have every time, everything we do, we have checks and balances so that it is fairly done. And if you want, we'll give you this one. We started the awards uh, uh, in the Chicago meeting. And we are now uh, proceeding in, in this meeting. And we would proceed into the future because this is the only way an, inst uh, an organization can say thank you to the hard work and uh, everything that they sacrificed for the for the institution. So quickly, you can get all the information on IACAANA.org. Uh, and I will quickly go through what did we do on the Chicago one. Uh, we gave to Dr. Supra Gunapudi uh, the award uh, for his uh, service. We gave it to Yash Bhatnagar, Subra and Yash were the first founding uh, you know, uh, chairs of this who really worked very hard. And then uh, we gave it to Rama Kerala, who did an excellent work uh, for the benefit of the institution, also the first global conference. And uh, then we also gave it to Professor Mohan, who bridged both the continents. OK, and then Dinesh Tirumurthy, very few of you may know him. But he made tremendous efforts with Raji, if she is around. They made 35 members organization to five member, 500 member organization by calling every alumni in North America. Okay? That is the contribution when a plant is small to make it stronger and grow bigger is equally important. And that's why we gave it to uh, Dinesh Tirumurthy. And I was given, sorry. Uh, I was uh, I had to be included for some reason, and uh, uh, I am very happy for that. Now we'll come to the Bangalore 2015, uh, you know, thank you uh, awards. Here we have four awards, and the first one is to the uh, Professor Sunil Kumar, and uh, he was spearheading. He was spearheading the global conference. And uh, he was uh, so inspirational. And more than anything else, his, uh, his uh, organizational skills were tremendous. Yes, here it is. So I, will, I request uh, Professor Balram to give this to Professor Sunil Kumar. So this is what uh, the Plex, uh, you know, writes about for chairing and playing key role in the organization of uh, Chicago Ana meeting uh, with the, uh, Chicago alumni, second alumni, I, second IAC alumni global conference. So the second person is Swami uh, Swaminathan Ramesh, who was also a vice chair of this uh, conference. Unfortunately, he could not come here. So I, I request uh, Dr. Subra to come and take this uh, plague first for Swami. See, I, I'm given 10 minutes, and I'm trying to do it in eight minutes. So that's the spirit. 
<laughs> See, in America, we do everything from cleaning to being CEOs. Okay. So the third one, uh, this is the plaque. And third one is to Murali Dhar Ghantasala as the third co-chair of uh, IS, the second IIS alumni global conference. Murali, run, run, run. And this is more or less like, and uh, finally, last one is the best one. Mohan Raj Goyal was there, I'm taking one minute here, was there, is there, and will be there with the organization. He is the strongest pillar of the organization, and he has done tremendous amount of service to the organization without expecting even a small amount of returns. And we are really proud that he is one among us, and we are proud to give this to Mohan Raj Goyal. And for that, I ask Gaj Birur to come and take it. Unfortunately, Mohan is also not here. So, become members of IACA or AANA. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Since the inception and for unwavering commitment and for tireless efforts during the organization of the first and second global conference and for the development and maintenance of AACA in an official website. And thank you, Satish, for reminding me. But he also did one more thing. If you have noticed, our emblem has changed. And that change is also because of uh, uh, Mohan Raj Goyal. And in, you know, when we are really blessed to have excellent people dedicated without any selfishness and wanting to give to the uh, organization, to the institution, and utilize us, we are under the stewardship of uh, Dr. Arkel uh, Shanoi and uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Satish uh, 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 Nagaraja. Okay, so and uh, become members of IAC Ana or IAC and give back to the community, to the institution, and to the world, okay? That's what we should have in our mind. And we also thank all the members of uh, uh, the uh, organizing committee, or whatever it is here, who did fantastic work uh, organizing the conference. Thank you very much. We'll hold on for a tea break here before we move on to our evening panel discussion session of IAC and alumni. Thank you.